tried to blow one of these whistles and you wondered why you can't make it change pitch like an engineer can make a real steam whistle change pitch? Well, welcome to Whistles 101 and we're going to answer that question and a whole lot more today in this video. This is the next installment in my Railroads 101 series and today we're going to talk about everything about steam whistles. We're going to talk about when you use a whistle. We're going to talk about the different parts and the way that the whistles actually work and we're going to get a little nerdy and get into the acoustic science behind how whistles work and that will help us answer the question of why that wooden train whistle can't change pitch near as well as a real whistle can. Locomotives have whistles for primarily two purposes, and that is to be either a warning device or a communications device. So as a warning device, a whistle's purpose is really to warn train crew and general public what the train is about to do, whether the train's gonna move forward, move backwards, make sure you're not in the foul or not ahead of the train's direction of motion, or that the train's gonna come through a grade crossing, something like that, or even just a general warning whistle to someone who's too close to the tracks. As a communications device, the whistle is used to talk to train crew members. The train crew can respond back with hand signals, provided there's line of sight to the engineer, or in the more modern era, can respond via radio, and the engineer can simply acknowledge with a couple toots of the whistle. Additionally, as a communications device, if there's more than one steam locomotive operating on a train, if you've got a double header or a mid-train helper, something like that, the engineer on the lead engine, who's overall controlling and responsible of what the train is doing can communicate to the second engine or third engine or however many there are and then ensure that what's about to happen is communicated back to those other engines so things can be coordinated. Now like many of the things we've talked about on the channel so far, there is of course the railroad nature of these things that plays into it where Every railroad historically had slightly different whistle signals in their rulebook and timetable. I can't give you an exhaustive list of these are all of the whistle commands that any railroad possibly could ever use, but most of the primary ones are consistent across most railroads, so I'm going to give you all of the whistle signals used by the railroad that we see most often on the channel, the Denver and Rio Grande Western. Of course, we're in Colorado, right? If you hadn't noticed the new setup behind me. A number of those signals are gonna be applicable to other railroads out there, but this should be a good enough example case for you to then understand all the different varieties of whistle usage and then take them to your model railroad or to your video game, or if you're out there actually running the real thing, you can understand why we're using these different signals. So I'll include include this list of whistle signals off to the side so you can read along, but this is a sample from a Rio Grande timetable of all the different whistle signals that might get used. The circles represent a short blast of the whistle and the dashes represent a long blast of the whistle. The first one we have is pretty simple, a single short. That means stop or the train has come to a complete stop. This is useful for when you're coming into a stop location, make sure that everyone understands, okay, we're not gonna move anymore. I can get off of the train or I can proceed with whatever task I need to do. Next is two long blasts of the whistle and this means proceed. And that means, okay, we're about to go forwards in the direction of the train's setup. Two long whistles, we're gonna go. I clarify specifically in the direction of the train's setup because the forwards that the locomotive is facing may not always necessarily be the true forward direction for the train, though probably 99% of the time that's the case. The next four are whistle signals that are gonna need a little bit of context and they might seem a little weird if you're unfamiliar with the concept of flag protection and operating under track and time style operations. So before the days of radio and before the days of having track circuits or signals or anything like that, trains basically operated on the basis of, okay, you are engine 491, you need to run westbound on this track. It's a single track, there's passing siding here, passing siding here. You need to make it to this point to meet another train at a certain time. And everyone needed to just assume that that was going to work and make that happen. 
So what happens if they're running too slow for some reason, they encounter a problem, they have to stop and fix something, they're not going to make that meet? Well, what is the other train going to do? How are they going to protect themselves? Well, the answer is they send their brakemen out as flagmen, and they might send them out both directions, depending on the other traffic that is operating that day. They might send them out one direction, but these four whistle commands are specific to sending out flagmen out ahead to protect, or out behind to protect the train, and then ask them to come back to the train. So if for some reason, the air brakes go into emergency, they need to inspect the train, figure out what happened. Okay. Boom, they stop. They're expecting to meet a train on the head end. Okay. They call to protect the head end. One of the brakemen goes sufficiently far enough ahead of the train that he can stand there with a flag and warn any other trains that are coming saying, hey, we're stuck in the middle of the track up ahead. You need to slow down and be ready to stop once you see the train. And then once they would fix the problem, then the engineer would call with the whistle commands to bring that flagman back. This was a way that you could protect your train if there was ever some unforeseen consequence of railroad shenanigans that meant you had to stop. In more modern eras, nowadays we have radio and we can tell dispatch, or we have signals that protect and everyone comes up on a red signal and says, okay, well there's something going on, I can't go into that block. But in the era where you don't have any of that, you send a guy out with a flag, and you needed ways to command that person. Now this specific timetable was for a subdivision that ran east and west, and so the commands are only for east and west, and that is specifically railroad subdivision east and west, not true east and west. If you have a railroad that mostly runs west, but maybe it jogs straight south or straight north or something like that, if you're running towards the western end, they consider it west, and that's that. And so this command means no matter if it's actually north that they're walking, they're going westbound down the railroad. So you would send that command. Uh, north and south would be the same set of commands for east and west, but just for a railroad that runs north-south on the timetable. But in this case, this is specifically for the chunk of the Denver and Rio Grande Western that runs from Chama to Antonito, the Cumbres and Toltec, as it is in the modern days. So this portion of railroad is east-west only as far as the timetable is considered. Here's one that I've never used and I hope to never use. Three long whistles, which means the train has come apart, the brakes have gone into emergency, you know, if for some reason someone on the train couldn't see that, or the conductor or brakeman were looking at something else, watching wheels or something, and they didn't catch what happened on the gauge on the rear end, here's an obvious, hey, we need to put this thing back together, something's gone wrong. So this next one might seem similar to the two longs of the proceed signal that we had previously, but it is now two shorts, and that means release the brakes, and it's also used as a generic answer of yes, basically, to any other signal that's out there. And so this is typically used when you're doing an air brake test, whether it is the initial terminal air brake test or a running air brake test. And then the engineer puts the automatic brake valve in run or release, depending on, to blast the whistle, it tells the train, hey, everything's released, check the gauge at the rear, make sure that the air pressure has restored to the correct amount, that kind of thing. It's also commonly used in switching. If someone's giving car counts on a shove, they can't look back and get a visual confirmation from the engineer going, yes, I understand you. The engineer can give two quick little toots as they're giving car counts, uh, or any other sort of thing like that. These days, we also use the too short signal for simple answers to things on the radio as well. There's a lot of times where the radio is really not in a convenient place because they didn't have built-in locations for it on the locomotives we operate, so it can be kind of hard to go grab the radio, and if you don't need to provide a response other than just yes, or I understand, two quick toots of the whistle, the cord's right there, it's pretty easy to do that. It's pretty similar to uh, military outfits doing two clicks of the radio mic to just say yes, but in our case, it's with a whistle. This next one is another dual purpose one. It is three short blasts, and while you're standing still or stomped, three short blasts means, hey, we're gonna back up relative to the train again, 
but while running it means we're going to stop at the next station. And this is one that comes up uh, on a lot of questions with Rio Grande stuff and videos, the Coombrace and Toltec or, or whatever, that, you know, why are they blowing the whistle at these certain locations and what does it mean? Well, three shorts means we're stopping at the next timetabled station location. And we'll, and we'll talk a little bit more about that further down the table. The next one is the sassy one. <laughs> Four shorts, which means, hey, I'm waiting here, what do you want me to do, basically. If you've completed your tasks, say you're at a water stop and you finished filling the tender up with water and you need to ask the conductor, hey, are we good to go now? You'd give four short whistles, the conductor would then tell you, okay, yes, we're all on, you know, go, or no, hang on, we still have something else to do, or etc. It's a call of, hey, what, what do I gotta do? What do we need to do right now? And uh, I call it the sassy one because it's quite often that it's like, all right, conductor's not paying attention, toot, 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 what are we doing? <laughs> it's past time, we should be leaving. I can't leave until you tell me that I can. Wake up. <laughs> this next one is one that most of you should know at this point. It is the grade crossing warning whistle. This one's pretty universal. It is a long, long, short, long. That is the standard warning for a highway railroad grade crossing. Now, if you guys want to learn more about grade crossings, let me know down below. I'm actually planning on doing grade crossings 101 pretty near here because I think they're a, a pretty neat topic and there's usually a lot of opinions that fly around with them. So I think that'd be a pretty fun video to do. It's not necessarily used as the warning for every grade crossing. A lot of times private grade crossings or smaller crossings will get a standard warning whistle rather than a big grade crossing whistle. Depends on the railroad and exactly what the timetable says. So this next one is just one long and this happens while running and this is the segue from what we were talking about earlier. So for the Rio Grande at least, at certain locations that were noted on the timetable as a station, whether or not there was an actual passenger station or not, the engineer would blow one long whistle to ask the conductor what are we doing here? Are we gonna stop or are we gonna continue on? And then he would look back, see what the conductor is doing, and the conductor would either give a, nope, we're gonna keep going, or nope, we are going to stop, giving one of those hand signals. So on the modern day Cumbrace and Toltec, you will see this signal used at a number of different distinct locations. The most common one that gets a stop answer, like we talked about earlier, is when they're coming up to the Lobato trestle with two locomotives. And that is because historically the trestle was only rated for one of the K36 type locomotives to run over it at a time. It didn't have enough strength to hold two of them safely. Uh, these days I believe the bridge has been rebuilt and they just keep the practice going for the sake of authenticity. As the train approaches Lobato, the lead engine blows the one long whistle looks back, the conductor will tell them to stop because they have two engines, and then he'll answer with three once he sees what the conductor does. Okay, we're stopping. But if they weren't stopping, they only had one engine or it was a different location, you'd just get two, as we talked about earlier. Okay, we're not stopping. Keep on trucking. The next one is also similar to this, but more specific in that there is a scheduled meet at this location. A long, long short. This means that hey, I'm approaching our dedicated meeting point. If you're on the approach, you should know that I'm not in the siding. I am approaching that point. The first train that arrives at the dedicated meet would blow that and then come in, stop at the meeting point, depending on priority. Specifically for meets on single track territory where there's lots of different passing tracks, there's a lot of different rules that govern whether or not a train has priority over another. But for the purposes of focusing just on whistles for this video, each train that is approaching that meeting point does the long, long short, whether it's the one that's going to go and park in the siding or if it's the one that's supposed to run through and hopefully the one that is parking in the siding is the one that gets there first otherwise the other train gets delayed but there's all sorts of fun rules about that maybe timetables 101 might be something that we should do down the road too. This next one is the generic warning whistle long short it's applicable if someone's too close to the track private grade crossings like we were talking about all sorts of different stuff like that if you need a, a generalized warning 
that's that. A lot of times this will also be required at the entrances to tunnels, for example, to make sure anyone that may be illegally in the tunnel or any other trains on the other side know that there's a train on the approach. If for some reason that that warning does not work, they write the just jiggle the cord a bunch into the timetable and it always makes me giggle. You don't have to do that many short blasts of the whistle, you just blow the whistle until they get out of the way or things happen. These next two are specific to double heading and it's about who has control over the air brakes. The reason that you need to have these two whistle signals is because in the days before those MU style brake systems, the only pipe that runs all the way through the train is the brake pipe. And so you can only have one brake stand in control if things are going to work correctly. So you have to cut out the other brake stands. So if you have two locomotives, you have to have one of the brake stands cut out. With double heading, you have the first locomotive, the train behind it, and then you add the helper locomotive on top of the road locomotive. So initially, the road locomotive is going to have control over the air brakes on the train, and then when you add the helper on front, the helper needs to take control. So these two whistle commands are used to hand the air either forwards to the helper locomotive or backwards to the road locomotive. And they're really only used when you add or remove that locomotive. You use the one command when you add the helper. Okay, I'm cutting my brake stand out. You've got the brakes. Make sure you repeat it to acknowledge me. And then the other one is used when you're at places like Lobato, like we talked about, where you come up, stop, we're removing the helper engine. Hey, you need to take control of the brakes again because I'm going to be leaving you. So I'm going to be cutting the locomotive off. Make sure you cut your automatic brake valve back in so you have control over the brakes. And this last one is also specific to air brakes, but this is more specific to an air brake test. And that is the long short. Hey, I had a ton of leakage when we were doing the air test. Go find the leak. We'll probably cover how an air brake test works at another time. One of the engineer's responsibilities during the air brake test is to monitor the actual air brake pressure and make sure it's not leaking too bad. You are allowed some amount of an air brake leak, but as soon as it breaches that limit, you have a problem and you need to fix it. And it's also not really fun to run with a train that leaks either because you end up messing with the automatic quite a lot if you're running down a significant hill and of course you're wasting more air which can put you in more of a troubled situation. So if you exceed that leakage the engineer would blow this whistle signal to let the train crew who have been inspecting the brakes during the brake test go look and listen for hissing and see if they can figure out what's leaking and hopefully repair it so that things can be brought back into order. So that's the whole table of Denver and Rio Grande Western whistle signals. We did talk a little bit about double heading signals with that, with the air brakes being handed forward or backwards, but some of these signals are repeated by the second engine and some of them aren't. The whistle signals that are repeated by the second engine are the ones that have to do with starting, or station stops coming up. So the lead engine will blow two long whistles, hey, we're leaving, followed by the second engine to make sure they're both on the same page. They both start applying power as they leave. Then as well, as you're approaching station stops, the lead engine will do the call, look back at the conductor, see whatever the answer is, be it stop or go, and then blow the corresponding two, yes, we're continuing, or three, no, we're stopping, and then the second engine will copy the two or three, whatever the lead engine does, acknowledging, yes, okay, we're going to be stopping, or no, I need to continue providing power. Things like grade crossing warnings and stop signals and flagman signals, etc., are repeated, as it's not really necessary for the actual communications of what the train's going to do. If you're coming up to a grade crossing, there's no change in what the rear engine needs to do. If you're stopped, the lead engine has control over the air, so it doesn't really matter for the second engine what they do, so you just have the one stop signal. So one of the most romantic and wonderful things about a steam whistle is actually the ability for the engineer to quill the whistle, which is just a fancy way to say you can make the pitch change when you pull the cord differently. We'll get into the science of that a little bit later, but right now I want to point out how 
cool that really is. It's kind of something that's of that bygone era of steam locomotives that you don't really get these days anymore because you don't have that fine control. Back in the day, you could tell what engineer was running the train just by the way that he blew the whistle. Take a look at these couple clips of some folks at running at the museum. Each of us blows a grade crossing differently. <laughs> So you can hear those three examples, we each have our own style, and you can tell, oh that's Jeff, oh that's Brett, or that's Mark, whoever's running. You could just tell just by the way that we blow the whistle. As far as the rules of hitting those whistle commands we talked about, it's entirely based on the whistle stopping or starting. So it doesn't matter what you do crazy with the pitch in the middle, it's still one long whistle, no matter if it goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, or whatever and some engineers, particularly over on the east side of the country, tend to get a little bit uh, extra zealous with it, and it's a point of many contentions, but it's something that you don't hear anymore that's really, really cool, because you really can't get those changes with an air horn anymore, because these days, most of the air horns are controlled by a magnet valve. You pull the handle, it closes an electrical contact, and the horn just goes. It's just a magnet-operated valve. You can't have any control other than off on. In early diesel locomotives, when you just had a valve that you were controlling with your hand, you could feather it a little bit, but even then, it's just an air horn. There's only so much play to be had. So this is really something special about steam whistles, and I felt like I'd be remiss to not mention it. But what makes up a whistle itself? What are the different parts that build one, and what are the different types even? Well. Let's go jump on over to the Colorado Railroad Museum where we can take a look at a bunch of different whistles and actually take them apart and see how they tick. Special thanks again to the Colorado Railroad Museum for letting me film out there and getting to share all of this knowledge with you guys. So we're back in the museum's boxcar full of whistles <laughs> and whistle bits and a number of other different things. And here we have my six chime here relegated to holding down the shop floor. But I figured we could talk about the different parts of the whistle with whistles actually in hand. In previous Railroads 101 videos, I've been drawing stuff out on the computer, but thankfully today, here we are and I've got the actual bits in front of me, which is pretty cool. So here's my whistle and it's all put together. And you can see that it is a horizontal button valve style operated whistle, the valve separate. We ran out of two inch couplings, so there's a union there. That's a little hokey, but here's what it is. This is the bowl, the bottom here, and then this is the bell, the top. Let's take a look at these individually. This is the original bowl that I was gonna use for my whistle, and this is the stud that I created. <laughs> I could have turned this down to save some weight had I cared a little bit, but I didn't. But this is so big so that it meets the inner diameter of the pipe to keep the bell centered over the bowl. And so in the bowl, there's what we call the languid plate right here. And it's very important that the gap between the languid plate and the exterior of the bowl is precisely centered and the correct distance for the steam pressure you're going to operate at. If you don't get that correct, the seam isn't going to strike the bell of the whistle at the right spot, and it's not going to make the right sound. You certainly can have tighter ones, or smaller diameters rather than larger ones, but the whistles tend to sound a little interesting if you do that. Ideally, the gap in the languid plate to the bowl, this little slot here, will be centered on the outer part of the bell here, so that as the steam rushes out of that gap, Half of it goes inside the chamber and half of it goes outside the chamber. And that will give the ideal resonance of the whistle. Because ultimately a whistle is basically like a flute. You're blowing 
air, or in our case, steam across a little hole, and half of it goes inside, half of it goes outside, that creates resonance and a vibration in the material. And then based on the geometry of the material, we get those different sounds. Based on the length of the pipe, or in this case, the length of the whistle chambers, you'll get various different pitches out of the whistle. So remove the stud out of the bowl. And really, all this one is is an integrated button valve into the bowl. And then there is a support on the inside there that allows the stud to come in and hold the bell to the bowl. And then it holds the languid plate in place. And this languid plate's actually kind of frozen in place and I can't get it out. But <laughs> if it sits for a long time, it freezes up. Now here we have what's called a hooter whistle. It's a single chime. That's what they called them back in the day. You can see <laughs> Languid Gap's a pretty decent. It has been, it has seen some stuff. I believe this is actually 20s Hooter. I'm sure it's stamped somewhere. So she's had it for a while. But the reason I want to show you this one is that this one is a vertical operating valve style whistle. And when I say vertical operating valve, I mean that the valve travels up and down within this pipe here. So if I take the whistle and I flip it up, you can hear a clink. And that's the vertical valve. So there's actually a slot there. And when you put this lever in the slot and pin it in, and then you pull the whistle lever, it presses down on that vertical valve and it allows steam to flow around it. Here's one that's actually in place. You can see as you pull the lever, this would be the rest of your linkage, the plunger comes down and then it allows steam to flow around it. And then when it closes, it seats right there. And steam pressure actually holds that shut the whole time. There's also a set screw back here to make sure that the, the valve can't fall out and fall into the boiler. But that's an older style of whistle valve. And one of the weird things about those is that depending on the shape of the lever and how rounded it is and how it adjusts through the travel, they can bind and start to feel really weird, which is one of the things that we have with 491's whistle right now. 491's Rio Grande 5 chime uses the vertical valve style. It's been giving us a little trouble and that's why the, the whistles changed pitches a little bit because uh, some of the, the chambers haven't been firing properly. Um, and it was after we put a new valve in it. So it's kind of interesting. One thing to note about whistles is that it's just about the chamber length for the pitch. So you can see this whistle right here is just made out of pieces of pipe. Each individual and the languid plate gets one of the edges of the pipe. That whistle sounds like any other whistle. You can totally build one that way. They don't have to be these perfectly circular and fabricated like this sort of thing. Though that is what the majority of whistles do look like. Whether they're step top or flat top, or sometimes they even have rounded bullet nose tops, which can look pretty cool. But lots of different flavors, lots of different numbers of chimes, but really the only thing that matters is however many chimes you have is however many notes you might have or different pitches you have, which will give the whistle its sound. And then it's all based on that chamber length. So the distance from this striking edge to the inner cap is what sets the wavelength of what pitch the whistle will play. But you can see we have lots of vertical valve guys. The more modern thing and definitely the easier feel on the cord typically is the, the push button style. So those are the two different styles of operating valve and all the different parts that make up a whistle. Operating valve, bowl, bell, languid plate, and then the stud that holds it all together. So this guy is threaded on both ends, nuts here to hold the bell down, and then it's threaded into the bowl down here. So this bell can actually rotate separately of the bowl if you were to loosen the stud. And typically even, a lot of railroads had rules to aim the tallest chime in one particular direction to make sure that it would carry the furthest and give the loudest warning. And that was kind of different per railroad. Lots of little interesting, fun little details. Let's take it back to me in the studio. It's hot in here.
I talked about this a lot in the video where I talked about my six chime that I made, and that is that Yes, you need to have that striking edge that causes the vibration to happen, but you also need each individual chamber to be sealed for them to produce a note. You have to have that uniform vibration in the whole wall of the chamber. And so that's why my whistle didn't work originally, is because it wasn't sealed all the way, and once we welded it up, it worked great. So if there's a problem with one of the chambers and its seal, it's not going to function like you expect. So with that vibration happening at that knife edge, it's really important that the steam is flowing and hitting that edge. Because if you don't get even separation at the edge, you can get all sorts of weird sounds too. And there's a video out there of when we were down at the Cumbres in Toltec with the RGS-20. When we did a charter double heading with the RGS 455, it's really the 463 in disguise. But the 455 originally wore a six inch diameter five chime, but it was on a five inch diameter bowl. And so that meant the steam was hitting way far inside. And that was one of the worst sounding five chimes I've ever heard. So one important thing with whistle design is the actual gap between the languid plate and the outside of the bowl, and then where that gap actually resides. You want to make sure that the steam is coming out of that gap the correct amount and hitting at that cutting edge of the bell, and that will give you the best opportunity for the most resonance, which will make the whistle sound the most clean. There's a couple other things that affect the sound of the whistle, but they don't actually affect the physical pitch that it creates. A lot of people will talk about, oh, I love a great northern five chime, or I love the CB&Q five chime, or I love the Denver Grand Western five chime. This five chime is better than this one. Well, the funny thing is that all the chamber lengths on all those whistles are exactly the same. They are the same length, they're the same ratios, they're pretty much made from the same casting, they're just made out of different materials. And the different material provides to a different timbre for the whistle. And that word is spelled timbre, but it is pronounced timbre. I couldn't tell you why. English people can explain that, hopefully. <laughs> So one of, the, uh, one of the excuses us guitar players like to come up with is excuses for us to have lots of guitars. And so right here, I have my Stratocaster, and right here, I have my Les Paul. And functionally, they will play the same notes, they will play the same pitches. If they're tuned the same and I press the second fret on the E string on either one, they will make the same pitch, but they make an incredibly different sound, and that is because different materials in the guitar themselves, <clears throat> but most specifically in the case of at least an electric guitar, there are different pickups, single coil pickups versus dual coil pickups. And it's kind of a similar thing with whistles, where if a whistle's made out of brass versus some iron alloy versus some steel alloy, the whistles will have a different timbral sound. So if you prefer a CB and Q5 chime to a Rio Grande 5 chime, you like strats better than you like Les Pauls. That is the functional difference between those two things. And that's one of the reasons why the Santa Fe 6 chime that I built in that previous video we talked about is made out of steel. It's actually just made out of some pipes and quarter inch plate. But it sounds a little different than real Santa Fe 6s, or it sounds a lot different than a Southern Pacific 6, which has almost the same chamber lengths, but they're made out of different materials, and that's what provides that timbral difference. Again, it's like a Strat versus a Les Paul. They're playing the same notes, but they sound incredibly different. And it's actually funny how a lot of the different bells all have the same lengths, be it an Alco 5, a Rio Grande 5, Northern Pacific 5, I mean, they're all almost exactly the same. The levers can actually play a really big deal in how the whistle feels, and also how loud it is and the, the pitch variance that it gets. This is really applicable and really something you notice with the different size locomotives we have at the museum, because it comes down to a really large difference in leverage ratios 
from the cord all the way to the valve. And what I mean by that is the way our locomotives are set up, when you pull the cord, it pulls the big lever in the cab, which then rotates a shaft, rotates a smaller lever, that then pulls on a bar that runs all the way to another bar that is actually the bar that either presses down on the vertical valve or presses the button. So you've got a number of different levers in this equation. The differences in length in those levers will actually change how far the valve will actually open. And in most locomotives, this shouldn't make a difference, but in our little narrow gauge engines, like 20 and 346, where the whistle's mounted high on the steam dome, and you've got a super, super long lever that curves all the way down that's maybe a couple feet tall, you have a really, really big number in your leverage calculation versus 491, where the lever's maybe only seven or eight inches long. So it's a lot easier for 491 to get the whistle open further than on the 20 or 346, which is why a lot of times you'll see clips of the locomotives with steam whistles mounted up high on top of a dome that's much higher than the cab have a relatively quieter or more soft whistle. It's because for all the motion of the cord, the valve doesn't really open that much because the lever is so much larger to get to the whistle on top of the dome. I got in trouble as a volunteer for doing the math and realizing that we were only opening the valve on 346's whistle like 20% of the way that it could possibly open and I wouldn't stand for that so I made a, a lever <laughs> I made a nice short lever with a special bar that would then open the valve all the way if you pulled the cord all the way and then the neighbors didn't like us and yeah that lever got scrapped pretty quick which was sad but it was glorious while it lasted. So that's part of the reason why some whistles sound a bit more loud and, and out there, and some are a bit softer. But it's also part of the reason why the pitch may be different, is because you're letting more or less steam through the valve, depending on those leverage ratios. But that's not the whole story, and that doesn't answer our question from the beginning of the video as to why you can't quill or change the pitch really on that little wooden whistle and why we can change the pitch so significantly on a real steam whistle. And warning, nerd alert for you guys here, I am a mechanical engineer and I'm a musician. I did get a minor in acoustic science with my mechanical engineering degree so this is stuff that I really like to get into the weeds on. So if you ever wanted to know the reasons why a whistle sounds like it does, you've come to the right place. So let's get nerdy. There are many different types of instruments out there and wind instruments in particular, and all you really need is a vibration that excites the air and causes you to have a sound wave. Like on the guitar here, when I pick the string, I cause the string to vibrate and that's what's making the sound. On something like a saxophone with a wooden reed, you blow into the mouthpiece and then that wooden reed starts to vibrate and that vibration channels down the instrument to create the note. A whistle is most similar to a flute where you blow across a little hole in a tube and some of the air goes in the tube and some of it goes across and the flute itself is kind of like a knife cutting that airstream. Well the same is true for the bell of a whistle. And as the steam comes through the gap in the languid plate, it comes up and it strikes the edge of the bell of the whistle. Some goes inside, some goes outside. And that splitting action causes a vibration in the whistle itself. That's what starts to create the actual noise with the pitch varying on the length of those chambers. But it's not just that piece for the pitch. So there's a couple terms you're going to need to know if we're going to talk about the science behind how a whistle actually works. The first one is pitch. Pitch is the music and acoustic word for how high something sounds. And I'm not talking about, hey man, I'm talking about whether it's low or high. Or in easier terms, low or high. So this note is lower pitched than this one. And each of those pitches has a specific frequency that it is. A frequency is just the measure of how fast a sound wave is vibrating. So when I play this open note on my guitar, and then I play the octave, which is the same note but a higher pitched, it is actually twice the frequency. So what does this have to do with whistles? Well, the whistle's kind of like 
the guitar string. The reason that the pitch is higher up here than it is just open or basically down here, the reason that that pitch is different is that the length of the string has changed. When I'm playing the guitar open, the string length goes from right here all the way down to the bridge at the other end. So my total length is this long. It's as long as the scale length of the guitar. When I come up here and I play this note up here, I'm actually cutting that in half, exactly. So I'm changing the string length to be from this little fret wire here to the bridge instead. So we are now ignoring this chunk of string. This doesn't exist. This is our new string. Boom. So the shorter you make the string, the higher the pitch goes. And the same is true for whistles with a bit of an asterisk on it. A very tall whistle is very low pitched. The big boy's whistle's bell is really tall. And in reverse, you know, a five chime whistle, the tallest chime on a five chime is relatively short in comparison because they're higher pitched. And again, kind of like a guitar, when we have multiple chimes of multiple different lengths, we can play multiple different notes and we can start to play chords. Which adds a little bit more music and harmony to the sound and can help make the sound a lot cooler. I personally am not a fan at all of single note whistles. I really don't like them at all. They're kind of annoying and grating sounding, but three chime, four chime, five chime, six chime, whatever. They sound great. You get that harmony, you get that nice resonance and good feeling in there. Now, how does this relate to the question we asked? If it's just the length that changes the pitch, why can we change the pitch on the real whistle really easily with the, the whistle cord, and we can't really change the pitch on this whistle right here? When we change the length of the guitar string by fretting, we increase the pitch. And with a whistle, we only have one length. It's whatever the length of the bell chamber is from the edge of the bell to the inner edge at the top of whatever the chamber is, or if it's a hooter, the whole thing. And that is the set wavelength. It's effectively like having a string that's only this long. We can only play that note. So how can we change it so easily on the real whistle and we can't change easily on this? Because this is the same thing. This is geometrically equivalent to a real whistle, real steam whistle, with a set chamber length within the bell, though it's just made out of wood instead of metal. Well, there is the magic of steam and one of the reasons why steam is so important. I sat there and I wrestled with this question for a long time. I talked to physicists that I know and physics majors and, you know, uh, well, it's a quarter wave generator. The, the length of the whistle bell is a quarter of the wavelength, which with some math you can turn into the frequency, and that's that. That is what pitch the whistle will produce. On this whistle, that's 100% true. Each chamber length gives you a quarter wavelength. On the steam whistle, you need one extra piece of information to make that calculation happen. And that's the temperature of the steam. This whistle is being blown with air, and it is being blown in air, and that's it. A real steam whistle is enveloped in a cloud of steam. And depending on the pressure the locomotive operates at, the steam may be quite hot or it might be less hot. And depending on the amount of flow, the steam might be pretty hot or it might be less hot. And the heat of steam actually changes the speed of sound. So normally the speed of sound is 343 meters per second through air. So when people talk about Mach 1, they're talking about breaking the speed of sound. And for almost every calculation and music and sound and all these things, almost always we use that value of speed of sound in air. But the speed of sound in steam is different and it changes significantly based on the temperature of the steam. So when you get after the cord and you pull it all the way down, the steam cloud that is in the whistle causing the whistle to vibrate and surrounding the whistle is actually greatly affecting the speed of sound that the whistle's producing, and that is what causes the pitch change. So no wonder you can't make this whistle quill like your favorite engineer, 
there's no steam. You're stuck with the speed of sound in air, and any change of you blowing harder or less hard is just going to try and mess with the chimes and get more of this chime or less of this chime based on the actual vibrations you're causing. Whereas with a big six chime whistle like mine, as you get after the chord more, you're giving it more steam, which is getting higher temperature steam with more flow, and so the pitch increases. I wrestled with this question for years. I couldn't understand why, okay, it's a wavelength. It should just always be this wavelength. Why does the math that I do based on the, the chamber lengths not give me the notes I'm expecting? And it's because the speed of sound was not the speed of sound that I was using. So I, I love that little piece of knowledge, that little piece of acoustic engineering. So this effect of speed of sound changing in steam goes even further with these whistles too, where it affects each chime slightly differently. This is something that's bugged me that I actually figured out just this week by doing some research into the spectrograms of the whistles that we'll get to in a little bit. And so what ends up happening is that the shorter a chime is, the more the steam affects the change in pitch. So a longer chime from a short chord pull to a full chord pull won't change pitch too much compared to a very short chime, which will change pitch a lot throughout that same chord pull. That has nothing to do with steam distribution, with the flow of the bowl or anything. It is just a physical property of the steam itself and how it's exciting those different chambers. You can see in the spectrograms that there's more changes for the higher pitch tones, and it also seems to take more pressure to get the higher pitch tones to really start to resonate. You need more energy to create that faster cycling wavelength. And so this leads to a really neat sound, particularly with three chime whistles, which is what started me down this track anyways, where the root note doesn't change too much for us, the third note changes a fair bit more, and then the fifth even more than that. But the thing that you hear, the third interval, which is the second tallest chime, moves the most, and so it moves from sounding mostly like a minor third chord, kind of sad, to a major third sounding chord, a little bit more happy. The recordings I have don't have them actually getting to an actual major third chord or they're not tuned properly, but they get close enough that it sounds like a bluesy songs version of a major chord, which is pretty cool and it really makes the whistle sound different depending on how far you've pulled the chord. And that only happens because each chime has that slightly different response. This is the one little detail that a lot of video games get wrong, be it a whistle in Derail Valley or a whistle in Railroads Online or what have you. If you can quill the whistle and it's a multi-chime whistle, each chime changes slightly and, and you hear each chime slightly differently throughout the different pull of the chord. And so it's not just a simple linear pitch change of all the chimes change pitch. Each one changes slightly differently based on its own length and how much steam it's getting. So if you assume that each chime is getting the same amount of steam, the shorter chimes change more. And I'm thinking it's because they heat up faster or the steam is cycling through there faster because there's less space for the steam. I'm not 100% certain and I kind of want to look into it further, but we can see the results and know whatever the method or vehicle is that the smaller chimes are affected more by this pitch change. So even more fun and interesting to me is that we can actually see this and prove it using something called a spectrogram. And a spectrogram is basically a list of the frequencies, which are those pitches, over time in an audio signal. When you normally look at something like Spotify or whatever waveform player you have, you can see the volume over time as what you see as it scrolls along. 
But if you look at a graph of the different frequencies, you can get a lot more information from what sound file there is. And it's really interesting to look at different recordings of whistles and see how they vary in those spectrograms. One thing that has appeared in a number of different clips on the channel across a number of different videos is the fact that 491's Rio Grande 5 chime is just like totally beat to crap. It's got a dent in one chamber, it's got a huge hole in one of the chambers making it not seal, and if the chamber doesn't seal you can't create that vibration like we're talking about, or at least in an ideal way. So <laughs> it sounds a little weird. And so you can look at these spectrogram recordings and show that oh, we're only getting three chimes, or oh, we're getting three, sometimes the fourth is coming in and out, or okay, well, we messed around with the bell a little bit, now we're getting four, we're not getting all five chimes because that one chime has the hole in it. You can also use this information to look and figure out what chords the whistles are, what notes they're making, it's all sorts of cool stuff. Definitely look for a spectrogram analyzer if you want to learn more about your favorite whistle if you have a recording of it. So this is a spectrogram. I've got a number of different whistle recordings that we can take a look at, and there's lots of different ways that you can manipulate these and listen to these. This is a wonderful program called Spectra Layers Pro. Uh, definitely not free, but certainly a very fun program to use. But I've selected a way that we can look at this, and we can see the whole waveform, and you can see up top here, it looks like it does if you were to play it on any wave player like you're used to, any MP3 player, anything like that. That's the volume over time. But then this graph is the frequency graph over time. So you can see low frequency numbers down here up to high frequencies here, frequencies being measured in hertz. And again, these are the pitches that we were talking about. So it's interesting to look at a bunch of different whistles. We'll get into 491's mess here in a little bit because it's kind of fun. But first, I think it would be interesting to take a look at a whistle that was on one of the locomotives at the Great Western Steam Up. The Antelope and Western number one. It was wearing off of one of the steamships that worked on Lake Tahoe. It's got a very unique sound. So we can hear that and what we can do is we can see that there's three big solid lines of color and that's the fundamental frequency of the three chimes of the whistle. So we can select those and just play those. Always sounds a little spooky and synthy when you take away all of the uh, extra little hisses that sit on top, but these are the fundamental three notes. But we can see that part of the reason why this whistle sounds unique is that the spacing between the three chimes is pretty far. Usually they're pretty close together. And in this case, the lowest note is significantly lower than the rest. So if we hover our crosshair here in the middle, we can see it's about 268 hertz, then 444 hertz, and then up to 590-ish hertz, 570-ish hertz, somewhere in there for the three chimes. Next, we have an example whistle that is one of the ones that's helped teach me about how whistles work. And this is of a Denver and Rio Grande slash CB and Q three chime. Um, there's a couple of these floating around, I believe one's at the Dragon and Silverton, and we have the other at the museum. And it's interesting with these style three chimes where they will go in between what sounds like a major chord and a minor chord. So we take a listen to the file. Definitely A, a really cool whistle, but also very fun to see in this format here. And if we zoom in on the frequency spectrum, you can see as the engineer goes through the crossing, loudest at the end of their last long note, and then they trail off. The interesting thing to note about this is this is where I learned that the different chamber lengths get affected by the steam differently. Where when the whistle's blowing hot up here, and it almost sounds like a major chord, you have 320 hertz in the lower chime, 390 hertz in the middle, and 505 on top. 
But then here towards the end, when things are fading out, you have 300 hertz, 377 hertz, and 475 hertz. So the top chime is wandering further than the lower chimes. And if we really scale it up, you can see that even. If we were to draw a line of how the pitch has changed for the lowest chime, it is less steep than the lines for the next two chimes. Remember that the lowest chime, deepest pitch, is going to be the longest. So the shorter the chime, the more the steam's temperature or pressure change affects it as you go throughout the chord. And that's why these three chimes sound like they wander between a minor and a major chord. Now, if we take a look at 491, let's look at some Rio Grande 5 chimes and try and understand them. So, we've talked about in the videos recently of how 491 sounds like she doesn't get all five of her notes. And we've always argued, is it three, is it four, is it five, what's it doing? Well, here's a grade crossing from my visit in May. Okay, and we can see that there's certainly three throughout, and then this fourth one that's there, sometimes sometimes it isn't, so let's grab the fundamentals there. Ooh, ghost noises. We only get this guy right in there. It looks like he's missing otherwise. Okay, so we rotated the bell to try and fix that to see if we could change anything. And it did have a change, because you can look at this grade crossing from our last steam up, and you can see that that top chime is almost always there. So you can see that rotating the bell had an effect, though it did have an interesting thing where we lost the second chime in the middle of that. And I'm wondering what that is. Maybe the vertical valve we have uh, can wander around in the seat a little bit and uh, is changing the way that the flow goes through. We're going to have to look at that and take it apart and see. But I was curious and I was wondering how, what happened because it sounds way different than I remembered it. So I pulled up an old recording from 2015. And this is what it sounded like back in 2015. So we had a lot of the top chime in 2015 and a lot less of the other ones. But even then in 2015, you're only getting four notes. And if there wasn't a clearer representation of how much the pitch wanders, look at this. Let's zoom in again. Look at this pitch difference in the highest chime versus the lowest chimes. The highest chime on these Rio Grande 5s is, is just barely even 3 inches tall compared to the overall thing being 9 inches tall-ish. So this is a, a huge change. You can see how steep that is. That's really interesting. We're still missing the fifth chime. The fifth chime should live in here, but it's got a hole in it. So no, uh, no ceiling of the chamber, no sound. And we can prove that by looking at RGS-20 where we can see same whistle, same casting, same thing, but you can see that 20 doesn't get quite all five. She doesn't get the highest one all the time, but she does get four that are pretty evenly spaced here, whereas 491, we're obviously missing something in the middle there. So let's compare 20 to 491. Versus 491. So it's really interesting to see some of these conclusions we can draw. We can also see the differences between these five chimes and the way that they're set up, because the bell is the same on these two whistles. Same material, same casting, everything. So if we look here, we can see that the lowest chime on 20s, five chime, is about 350 hertz. And if we look at 491s, it looks like it's about 367. So it's a little bit higher pitched on 491. And again, that's going to be because of the leverage ratio that we talked about. 20 can barely get hers cracked open, whereas 491 can get screaming. So if we were to put a shorter lever on 20, theoretically, we could get 
those higher pitches to match. But anyways, these spectrograms are just a really, really cool tool to learn different things about audio signals and also to edit audio signals. All right, guys. That's pretty much everything I have to talk about whistles today. I know it got way nerdy at the end, and I hope some of you stuck through that with me and, and enjoyed that sort of stuff. I get way into the weeds on that stuff, and I, I think it's really cool to really understand how these systems work. It's one of my favorite things in the world is learning how these things work and trying to get that understanding. So hopefully I was able to present it in a way that you guys enjoyed, and hopefully you learned something too. Maybe some of you guys will go out there and use this new knowledge to make your own whistles, which would be just awesome. I've gotten at least one person who sent me pictures of a replica of my whistle they made, and it was one of the most touching things I've ever seen. So that's really, really cool, and I really, really appreciate that. So anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Make sure you guys click the like button. If you're new here, make sure you subscribe to the channel as well. And then as always, thank you so much to the ESD train crew. The ESD train crew are the members of the channel who help support us monetarily. It really helps me out and they get some sweet benefits on the side. So you get to see thumbnails of the new videos beforehand. You get to know what's coming. You get some more communication from me. The conductor tier gets extra special videos on the side that are all kinds of fun stuff, whether it's seeing my dogs at the house or seeing cool behind the scenes stuff at the railroad museum. So if that interests you, you could definitely look into channel memberships. And if you're a part of my Discord, the channel members also have their own private chat that we just added into the Discord. So it's not even listed in the perks, but it is there. So it's a really easy way to get a hold of me. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you guys enjoy this 101 series. We'll see you all next time.